had first come to learn about Tiffany Thayer some nine years ago, during the beginning of my active search for books that would fit what Lovecraft termed as the weird, namely fiction centered around unusual, fantastic, and often disturbing elements, not always needing to be either supernatural, but evoking always certain feelings of dread, unease, confusion, and awe. Now, Fantasy and Science Fiction magazine hosts a curiosity section which had provided me with other reading materials such as The Exploits Wendelbrecht by Maurice Richardson, Rex Stout's Howl Like a God, Small Creep's Day by Peter Carroll Car Car Brown, and the Stella The Other Side of the Mountain by Michel Bernanos. And on the first entries, the third, in fact, dating back to 1998, is an article by William Tenn focusing on Dr. Arnoldi by Tiffany Thayer. The book was set to detail the miserable consequences of just what would happen if people simply stopped dying. Tenn rounds up the summary by saying, Thayer ends the novel with an understandable plea to every deity from Adonis to Zeus. The next time you have an idea like this to give away, you send it to H.G. Wells because I won't bother with it. Indeed, this description whetted my curiosity, but I was out of luck seeing that the book was so hopelessly out of print that not even the the scalpiest of online bookstore scalpers, who shall remain unnamed, were offering a copy at any price. One of the few things that would greet me when looking it up every couple of years was a bitter plea of another would-be reader asking for offers on the book at practically any price at all. Yet uh, even he remained unsuccessful. A few years ago, Ramble House finally gave away the few of us who knew about the book the chance to read it in its new edition, complete with the introduction by Chris Mickle. This introduction paints a man who likes to shock, writing novels often this dub risque and earning himself a bit of an infamous reputation at the time. Thayer seems unwilling to bend to conventions in literature, which is probably how Dr. Arnoldi came about, and might have also... Uh, resulted in both the Greek and in his unfinished final project, which we'll get to later. Now, Dr. Arnoldi is indeed a book that, at best, can be called hideous. It gives you a glimpse of a terrible future reality, excess, gore, extremity, all these labels no longer applying. What the novel eventually turns into can, at best, be dubbed cosmic hell, one without any gall to the devil, just an infinity of unimaginable, grotesque, distorted ugliness. Even these words all seem inadequate to, to describe it. Adding to the oddness of the book is the fact that the title character was not created by Thayer, but was a character in Mikhail Artsibashev's The Breaking Point, a novel about a suicide epidemic. It seems that um, Thayer just took the character of Dr. Arnoldi and then put him into his own book. And you know, I'm not even really sure how legal it may have been at the time, although given Thayer's status, I kind of doubt the book would have really become very you know, much, much known in Russia at the time. Plus, uh, there was that whole, you know, Soviet thing going on, so I probably wouldn't care. About, no one probably would care about that at the at that point in time. Now, I would like to talk about um, uh, Dr. Rinaldi. However, it's a book that at best has to be experienced on its own, because were I to start quoting you things, it would, it would utterly ruin the effect. Honestly, there are, there are many situations and many interesting things that would be ruined if I were to go into them from now, and it's really a contrast into the slow sort of plodding beginning, which almost resembles a, a, a thriller of the period, with the, main, with the sleazy main character kind of worming his way into sleeping with, uh, with another man's wife, you know, just around the time that man goes into, uh, goes into permanent vegetative state after an accident. However, I do think that the Greek, another of Thayer's books, deserves to be mentioned, if at all, because it's far less well known. Because Dr. Arnoldi has a tiny little veneer of infamy to it. It's an infamous little book that a few dedicated connoisseurs brought up from time to time, and which for well over 60 years was completely inaccessible. So, uh, there was a certain interest in Dr. Arnoldi from the start. However, the Greek, which is another interesting book by Thayer, a very interesting book, does not have this infamy. Now, 
It, this book appeared three years before Dr. Arnoldi in 1931, and it does not present Adjunct of a Startling Vision being more of a feat that this book... Uh, well, it is indeed a feat when this book is not the most unusual book by its author, because uh, this this book would have been a, a real oddity in any other writer's uh, uh, his bibliography. For starters, the main character of the book is Tiffany Thayer himself. Tiffany Thayer wrote himself into the novel as the central focus character, which is already confusing, but Thayer has himself help a Greek descendant of Pericles, named Paros, become Emperor of the United States. Thayer becomes the self-admitted Mussolini, proudly self-admitted Mussolini, although this was 1931, so maybe you could excuse him a bit for that, I don't know. Uh, to Paros' Victor Emmanuel and begins trying to dismantle Western society by legalizing rape but not committed by at least four people, abolishing schools or ordering the culling of the infirm, age or mentally inadequate, while conquering much of Europe and reintroducing slavery into the United States. It's weird because these things are so... At times it sounds like a parody, almost, almost and I think it may have been, but it's not really funny, it's just kind of odd in this fashion. These things just sort of happen, but you would have expected some sort of, you know, uh, examination of the end effect of such grisly policy, but it's not really focused on at all very much. Instead, you just focus on Thea being an asshole well, and, you know, Paris being a kind of a dumbass and letting, this, letting Thea talk him into pretty much anything. The novel does begin promisingly, with Thea being hired to write up a family history about Poros's family, full of all the bloody and tantalising things his ancestors have gotten up to in the last two and a half millennia while getting to understand the secret society that he's protecting as far as his family to make them kings of Greece. These little vignettes are short but very interesting, and Thea's, both writer and his admitted avatar's, mocking tone works to spice them up in small doses. But after Poros takes over the US, the novel virtually stops having a plot, and for nigh on 200 pages, Thea just puts out contrarian legislation after contrarian legislation, and at times it seems like Thea was both using the novel as an outlet to vent about his own personal issues with real people and institutions, as well as sometimes seeming to be little more than the product of Thea being dead, he couldn't possibly get any more rebellious and anti-establishment with every passing page. This kills much of the mood of the novel, as the initial setup is drowned with a tidal wave of mockery and a tongue so far in Thea's cheek it, it had borne clean through. Years go by in stories, skipped by Thea seemingly at random, with no incidents or events notable happening, and the only thing of them Thea's mind being to list what shocking piece of legislation a society-shaking instrument he has come up with this time. The final few pages try to sp spring a serious plot twist on you, but it feels so distant from everything that came came before it and bear in mind asking us to feel any sort of great emotional pity for these characters when they've been kind of massively shit up to this point is kind of hard it can be kind of hard to really force yourself to feel any pathos or or sympathy for these people when they've been so such utter shit honestly i don't really understand what's even the point of these uh, of the whole uh, well, should I mention it? Oh, what the hell, I'll just, I'll just bring it up. Uh, the whole emotional thing, the whole centre of the finale is that uh, well, Thea's wife, which had left him for, Tha uh, for Paros, uh, dies in childbirth and he's really pissed off about it. But, you know, you would have think that he would take vengeance on him or something, but no, just kind of... It never really goes anywhere. The final few. Let's see. Oh yes. And this whole seems very much at odds with the previous section where Thea leaves several pages blank, so readers can write in the names of men whose death would be a benefit to the state. Literally, is like several pages that are completely blank, and you're supposed to write into your own book. I, I don't. I, okay, that's the, at least a novel little gimmick, I suppose. It seems that Thayer himself was intrigued by the basic idea behind the society since his King and King the Numbers is per supposedly a collection of stories focused on Pericles' descendants, so it could either be it could either be really interesting or it could just be the B-Rail that didn't make it into this book. Honestly, the book is so obscure and hard to find, I 
doubt I'll ever get to read it. Um, Thea seems very much contrarian, both in his published work as in his law, uh, as in the thing he tried and failed to complete. Because according to Miko, his last work was intent was an intended was <coughs> an intended historical romance called Mona Lisa, which was su supposed to be the longest novel ever written, uh, clocking in at some forty six thousand pages. But apparently, uh, it never got published in full. Only a very small fragment of it did. I'm actually kind of reminded of Henry Darger, although I don't. What what does it say about you when you, as supposedly a sane person who's actually managed to obtain some success in publication, you go out and write a novel that's three times longer than Henry Darger's *The Realms of the Unreal*? It's kind of kind of makes you wonder. <sighs> So that's really all I have to say about um, about uh, these two novels by Tiffany Thayer. I hope this was entertaining, and I hope to try and do more with this uh, in future. So uh, later. Oh, and just a bit of a postscript. I just found the very first used copy of the original Dr. Ronaldi on sale on A Books for over seven hundred pounds. So I guess that finally gives us a bit of a benchmark about how much you have to pay to get at one of those. But admittedly these days you can just pay like ten ten dollars or so for the uh, ten to eleven pounds for the uh, Ramble House edition. So uh, I don't really know who would pay that much, considering Thayer doesn't exactly have that great of a following these days. Oh well. Later.